I'm so pleased to be able to host this event. Uh, my name is Daniel Kern. I am the Chief Investment Officer of TFC Financial Management. TFC is a registered investment advisor that works with individuals and families based in Boston, Massachusetts. So welcome from the United States of America. We manage about $1.3 billion for a little bit less than 400 clients. I am also an independent trustee of the Green Century Funds, which is a fossil fuel free, environmentally sensitive mutual fund company, also based in Boston. Um, and I'm very pleased I have a, a great panel today. We are going to talk about the future of investing post COVID and talk about opportunities to contribute to a fair future. Um, so I've introduced myself. I would like for each of the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, and then we will, after that, we'll start, we'll start talking. Matthias, why don't you start? Thank you very much, Dan. My name is Matthias Ernst uh, from Essential Futura International. I'm the founder and CEO. Uh, we uh, invest primarily in privately held business globally with focus in the United States and in Europe. I'm German. I'm actually in my hometown, Heidelberg, as we speak, although the firm is in the United States. Uh, we also have an advisory business in the sense of that we sit on family boards from pretty wealthy international entrepreneurial families and to help them to uh, come to the next generations and without any major conflicts and helping them to get better organized. And this in conjunction with the private investments, I think this will help them uh, also to have a sustainable growth strategy and everything we do should have a positive impact on society. Terrific. Welcome. Fiona, would you like to go next? So, hello. So, I'm the president. I'm the CEO of an asset management company called Unigestion. We manage money for institutional clients. So, we're a B2B business. We only speak with institutional clients, which are pension funds, insurance companies, even wealth fund, endowment. We manage around $22 billion. Uh, and our clients are mainly in Europe, US, and a bit in uh, Canada and a bit in Asia. Thing. Welcome. All right, here. Um, I'm here. Uh, my name is uh, Yusin Wall, and I'm uh, actually uh, Dutch, but I'm, uh, I have an origin, uh, my origin is Chinese. So I came to this country, to the Netherlands, already 35 years ago. And uh, I found it a uh, uh, investment um, from 15 years ago. And we do m &A, uh, with a China relationship uh, between, between China and Europe and uh, sometimes America. Uh, so that's the uh, 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 directions are uh, unlimited, primarily in aviation, agriculture, biotech, and high tech. So that is, uh, in summary, my project. Terrific. Thank you, Yusei. And last but not least, Dima, welcome to the panel. Uh, hello, everybody. Sorry for being that late today, but uh, it was a very busy week. Sorry for everything. So I'm a Luxembourg, in, uh, a Luxembourg lawyer, and um, I am uh, specialized in investment funds and... Uh, <coughs> I'm uh, having many clients that are uh, making investments in uh, what we can say responsible investments. For the last two years, it is very uh, attractive for clients to see uh, putting their money into uh, responsible uh, investment placements. And uh, I'm here just to talk about my uh, uh, experience till today and also to to talk about the trends after the COVID uh, uh, period, which was very, very, you know, uh, <laughs> unexpectedly, dramatically, uh, you know, came here to our lives and everybody had changed his uh, daily life. So I'm not, it's very nice talking to you all. <laughs> Likewise. Likewise. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I should say that I, I look forward to us being able to do this together 
um, maybe uh, next year or do this in person rather than as um, uh, heads on a, on, a, on a screen. So uh, with that wishful thinking or hopeful thinking, why don't I start? Um, I think I see that there's a common theme between all of us on the panel um, in that um, integrating a commitment to society with our approaches to investing into advising, advising families. So I thought we would start by with a discussion about responsible investing in a post-COVID world. And some of the questions that, that come to mind are, what changes are you seeing in the responsible investment field? Have investor priorities changed as a result of COVID? And how are you coaching families and investors about navigating the intersection of social impact and investment. Um, Matthias, um, you, you had some you know, very interesting things to say in our prep call, so I'll kick it off with you, but I'd like to hear from, from all of you on your, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm in this field now for around 20 years, and as we all recall over this journey, what happened was that I was also part of the expert group of the PRI, the Principle for Responsible Investments. When we look at it, it's now getting mainstream. And uh, so, but it was a journey, which was a bumpy journey. It was not an easy journey. And uh, I would say when, we, when you start out, you look for the big asset gatherers, the pension funds, then the sovereign wealth funds, they are pushing it. Uh, on the other hand, you have the semi-institutional world, which are the families, and this was your question. Now, within the families, what we look at is the value chain of the families. What are the values of the families? What do the families really want? And there's certainly right now a clash between the older generation and the younger generation, and uh, it's not easy sometimes to navigate in the, in the family board meetings uh, because you want to have your values reflected. Good. So when you have your values defined, you want to find a manager or you want to find a framework that you really are guided. So you look for a methodology. Now, which methodology you want to have? And that's a question on definition. I try to keep it short. Social responsible investments, ESG, SDG, social development. Goal. What are we talking about? Let's talk about SDG, which is the most recent one since 2015, where you have the 17 goals. Number 17 is more an intergovernmental. But then you have 169 sub-goals. So you have data. You have static data. You have dynamic data. How do you map this data? And to which score do you come? And how independent are you? Do you have your values reflected as a family? Do you want to overweight? Do you want to underweight certain things? So what do you want to do? So it's an individual approach that you adapt to the values and then, on the other hand, to the investments. And what I see clearly, really clearly, that when the younger generation, and I'm talking about the that in the 20s, early 30s, if they take the helmet, I think a lot of money will change from existing asset managers, and they will change hand if they don't have good answers to how they come to their score, how transparent it is, or is it just a marketing exercise and riding the wave? So these people, at least the ones we talk to, they really want to understand in a very pragmatic way. And as a final takeaway from me, the new entrepreneur, the way of doing business, it's always separated between what is impact investing and what is the regular thing. I don't see this difference. Because ultimately, if you look at risk assessment, and we all are risk managers, we want to get a good return for the family. We want to get a good return for our investors or for us. We have a family. We want to make sure that we make money. And in this case, we want to also measure the social impact we create. So it's for me, there is no conflict at all if you run a for-profit business and you want to have a positive impact on the business in the long term and have a nice annuity business from the results and from the investments you do, liquid and especially illiquid, which is not that easy because it's much more complicated to do the due diligence based on the factors that you that you want to have in your personal methodology. That's terrific. Thank you. Yana, would you like to weigh in? Okay, so we'll go from another point because we manage money for institutional clients and our journey has been quite long also. 
So we started in 2004 because of our clients, because clients asked us, and at that point it was Scandinavian pension funds, which were quite in advance in Europe. And at that time, ESG was something which today is not considered enough to consider ESG. It was only a ESG exclusion and normative based on some uh, social uh, and environmental matters. So we started our journey in equity, then we went to private equity, then we went to ESG integration, and now more to impact. What we see in the market is that something which was very localized in institutional clients in the Nordics in Europe has become a major subject in Europe. And we see a move from ESG to impact slash sustainability. And I will make I explain what I see by that. ESG is more about making sure the company has the proper governance in order to deal with environmental, social and government issues. So it's very inward looking. And our clients were very interested to make sure that we invest in companies that are well managed to deal with these risks. And now it's evolving towards SDGs and purpose and impact. At the end, it's not so well much how the company is organized, but what does the company do and what is its purpose and it has a social purpose. So we see an evolution, which is a bit the same evolution that we see from shareholders, <coughs> stakeholders, the same current, but with the fiduciary duty of manager. I would say that in Europe, and this is not the case in the US yet, but in Europe, the fiduciary duty of management is going beyond delivering risk adjusted return to your clients, but also to include some social impact on how you invest the capital of your clients. Terrific. Well, well said. Demos, you're, you're on mute, Demos, the most commonly uttered phrase um, during the pandemic. Is it up? Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. So uh, what I wanted to say is the following. We have met for the first time with the ECG concept uh, a few months ago in, uh, in Luxembourg and in Greece when we have seen a basket created by wealth managers were from big uh, uh, international banks. In fact, saying that, look, this is good for the environment. Please invest in such a portfolio or this is good for uh, the health. This is good for the human rights, you know things like that. So the people are always uh, being pitched from the marketing side and they are not uh, being informed, well informed on what you are buying and what are the companies, but you are buying a share of an investment fund. And, you know, as the previous people said, we don't have what is transparency in this, <coughs> in this action. The investments are being made by uh, wealth managers and the wealth managers are taking the decisions, of course, by respecting principles that my clients, I'm not sure that they are aware of. But it is certain that everybody is looking for this and everybody is asking for this and this is the trend. Okay. So, of course, the good news is that you are not limiting your profits when you are investing in so, uh, responsible investments. That's the good news. But the, the question that comes with this is how come I'm not losing on profit when I'm not engaging uh, poor people or, people who are, or children to work in a, in a remote area? Meaning this is something that somebody has to give us answers. And this is something that we are looking forward to hearing from the panelists who are having very big experience in making directly the investments. Because I, I'm talking from the, from the side of my clients. We have uh, been pre, uh, present to several presentations about very important and very uh, interesting topics. But at the end of the day, we don't know how you are managing to, uh, I don't know, to, let's say, to uh, make a pharmaceutical marijuana without, uh, uh, without losing the profits, you know, that you used to have when you were making this in a more commercialized way, you know. That's my comment. That, that, that's a, a, a good 
practical and philosophical question, and I, I, I think about this in, in the context of, of renewable energy, and um, you need, um, we need a lot of cobalt. And where are you getting that cobalt from? How are you getting that cobalt? Um, uh, much of it is in the Congo, and we run into these, I think, challenges where you've got the intersection, you've got issues about profitability, but also the issues about the shades of gray when it comes to um, the, the, the greater good, but the sacrifices and trade-offs that are implicit with uh, some of the things that need to be done for, for the greater good. So that's- You know, uh, Daniel, if I, if I may make a small comment now, it's, it regards the electricity uh, in cars. We have the trend of electric cars. Everybody is buying electric cars, but what is the impact in the environment? How do we charge the batteries? The batteries <coughs> are being charged. Is it charged with, with carbon? Is it charged with fuel? How yeah. do we charge and how do we produce electricity? You know, it's a very nice marketing tool. You have zero emission car, but in order to charge it, you have to produce emissions. You know, it's... Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You fang. Your thoughts. Right. Um, being in operation in Europe, uh, doing China business, I've seen uh, the cultural uh, differences between two sides. And uh, uh, family businesses uh, are actually a common uh, phenomenon. And in Europe, you see many uh, long-standing family businesses and having already a long long-term goal, long-term value. And uh, China is a traditionally uh, very family business oriented economy. But since the past 40 years, uh, when China reopened its store, uh, the Chinese economy has been growing very quickly and family business as a culture remained. And yet China um, went, has gone a long way to learn from a short term getting rich uh, uh, sentiment to um, uh, the current uh, sustainability-oriented uh, uh, value creation business culture. I think we are uh, globally working uh, towards the same direction. It is no longer a speculative short-term making money, getting rich quickly, hit and run, and because that is not sustainable. And the Chinese have been paying heavy prices for polluting the environment. As a result of that, and they're now paying a lot of attention uh, to the sustainability uh, today as well. Uh, I do see the inter-exchange uh, between uh, the West and China and the Chinese are looking very much to uh, the sustainability as a value and the value creation for the future generation uh, is getting more and more important. Uh, furthermore, um, I do agree that the next generation worldwide will lead us to our future with the new input Hello. We've, yeah, and we've the lost, value they can I think we lost them. Maybe much more than in in the past. I have been lost. <laughs> All right. We we lost we lost you momentarily, you think, but oh, okay. So, so I'm back. All right. So what I'm what, what what I'm trying to say is that worldwide, uh, family business and long term value uh, has become a common uh, standard. And furthermore, uh, the next generation, new generation, is embracing a universal value uh, of creating more uh, sustainability and uh, through more uh, uh, more advanced technology, and make our world. Uh, a better place. I think it is to our generation, uh, the old generation, uh, to support the younger generation uh, to realize uh, our uh, no, further sustainability of, of, of the earth. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, a follow-up question that's, a, that's um, I'll acknowledge, it's a self-serving follow-up question. Um, we struggle with measuring impact and how to think about measuring impact for, for our clients. How did, does anyone want to share with the, the group 
how you measure impact for your um, for for your clients. Are there metrics you use? Is it more um, more subjective measures? How how do you how do you think about that, and how do you communicate about it with clients? I can start. I think a good framework is the SDGs and the goals and the sub goals, and try to quantify. Typically, I think the first discussion is which are the SDGs you want to put forward as an institution or as a client. For, for example, for us, we are very sensitive to SDG 13, which is climate. And therefore, then you, you start from there and you try to, to build some, some KPIs, quantitative <coughs> KPIs, to be able to measure the progress you're doing. But I, th I found the SDG framework a very good framework to start with. Let me maybe just follow up on that then, if I may. Absolutely. Um, I fully agree with Fiona, and, but the first starting point for me is, I, give, I like to give an example. If you have controversies, you want to make sure that before you start with SDGs or whatever, you want to make sure that you have some controversies that you say, okay, I don't want to have certain type of things. I don't want that. And then you go to the SDGs. Now, to implement the controversies, in the mapping of the data to the different SDGs is a challenge which is really not done yet, in my opinion. And regarding the SDGs itself, there are data points where it's very difficult. Is it now SDG A, B, C, or where, where do I put it? And this will have a different impact. And another thing is that I, that I really argue is very critical is the quality of data that we get. Because what is going on in companies? You can have an iron ore company, producing company, and they, they give to the market uh, a lot of data, beautiful data on, on labor and all this. They report a lot. And you might have another company that is much more sustainable where you say, wow, this is a very good company and they do very good products, but why is their score worse than the other one? Because they simply didn't report that much. So the, the companies that get the data, they need to get also the feed of the data. They need to get the data and then that they can map it out. And then it's the allocation of the data to the different SDGs that you want to play. And deriving from that, based on your methodology, you end up with a score. And this is your individual score, or it is a MCI World Awkward, or it is a from Bloomberg, or whatever it is. And then the question is, what fits for you, or which score you want to take? And as a final comment, and I think that's critical, you have an SDG score besides your credit score. And in the future, when a company wants to get a loan from the bank, you most likely, and Fiona, you're the one knowing that as a CEO, you might want to end up by having both that you have an SDG score and you have a credit score for your loan portfolio um, and, and maybe both and you merge it. That might be the, whatever the future will be, but it's clearly an additional layer in the due diligence, I guess. That's fantastic. That's very thought provoking. Thank you. Any, any other thoughts before I pivot to another, another topic? Okay. Why don't, we, why don't we turn to investing for long-term growth? So I would be interested in, in hearing you know, what, are, what opportunities are you excited about? What, um, what does the growth opportunity look like in a, in a post-COVID world? I, I think we, we um, might want to spend a few minutes talking about China and what, um, what opportunities in China look like, both from a post-COVID perspective as well as from a perspective of a world that's breaking into uh, China orbit and, uh, and, and America and, and America orbit as the two countries decouple. Um, so, um, open open ended dialogue. Um, who would like to who would like to kick it off? I can kick off. Uh, so, I think the, the environment is quite changing. So our, our view is that we're going to be in a high growth, high inflation environment for the next years. And the fact that the agenda of company will go more sustainable will be a source of inflation, by the way, because they will have to invest to be sustainable. 
and therefore as the location has to change because in that kind of world phones are not necessarily the safe haven they used to be and you have to have assets which are good in terms of inflation cover so i think we will be positive on equities positive on private equity and positive in cyclical so it's an interesting period because in the last two, three, four years, and we were discussing that in the chat before, diversification didn't pay. And at the end, the best performance was having uh, some bonds and some very uh, concentrated equity portfolio. I think going forward, a diversified portfolio with active bets uh, will be quite important. In, in that world, so two, two follow-on questions for you, Fiona. <laughs> Um, one is, is what does the inflation picture look like? Are we returning to a 1970s style um, inflation or is it some um, break from the deflationary past of the, uh, the, the last couple of, of decades? And then secondly, in a world in which, in which bonds aren't really a very good diversifier, what do you do to diversify your equity risk? So uh, first question, so contrary to market consensus and contrary to what the uh, central banks are saying, we're seeing inflation more as a phenomenon that will last rather than a transitory phenomenon. We see inflation around 2% in the US that is staying at that level for quite a while, but we also see very strong growth. And why do we say that is because although numbers of inflation are already quite high, it's only linked to production and uh, industrial uh, problems for the moment. The consumer has not started to, to consume as they did in the past. And when consumer will come, kick in, but also the fact that savings are quite high, this will have a huge impact on, on demand. So we see inflation being high, but we don't see a shock like in the 1970s, because obviously our central bank has learned how to manage this crisis and they won't want to and they don't want to have an equity crash that will put us back into recession so i think it will be a balanced act between accepting higher inflation for longer but not passing the the dangerous line in terms of asset allocation it's true to say that bonds obviously which will uh, which will be uh, Will, will not be the asset class for the future, obviously, uh, going forward, because obviously in, in a world where interest rate rate will increase and where bonds are already so low, it's very difficult to, to have this asset class. So we believe that obviously equity, private equity, everything that is linked to growth, because we see a growth environment is good, but also some uh, allocation to some commodities and some allocation to liquid hedge fund that will play something else than equity beta, but will play perhaps macro environment and things like that. Terrific, that's great. Who else would like to weigh in? I'd like to uh, say a few words. I think in the post-pandemic uh, era, we are having a worldwide um, uh, overheating wave coming up uh, because every country is printing very much uh, the money. Uh, so there is a, um, uh, a huge liquidity uh, going around. Uh, but that has, uh, I think in the past, it has shown that um, liquidity has driven up as consumption uh, pattern. And so the consumers will consume more. I think that is what uh, Fiona has been uh, mentioning as well. As a result, the total size of the market worldwide will increase dramatically. That will uh, enable uh, the production to go up, uh, particularly in the uh, uh, luxurious uh, segment. The people are consuming much more. We can't imagine, let's say, 20 years ago that everybody is buying a, a iPhone uh, being so expensive, but today it is just uh, something that you, can't, you cannot think of without uh, in your daily life. I think the same will happen with uh, traveling, and we have uh, experienced uh, a, a longer period of time of uh, low cost traveling, uh, but in the post pandemic era. I expect business jet traveling will be more popular. So business people will travel from China to Europe and the other round to, uh, to America more by business jets than by the su uh, super jumbles uh, with a few hundred people sitting together. Uh, so you see this uh, happening and yet people are more conscious of their, their uh, consumptions to be more conscious of them 
uh, environment and more conscious of sustainability. And therefore, the SDGs, I think, will become a part of the consumption pattern. People would like to choose for more for uh, uh, a more greener um, uh, product. But what will that be? It is really question, a question of uh, guidance uh, from the government or the international organizations in uh, clarifying the standard, being more transparent on what, we, what we're doing. And uh, uh, social media, I think, will also play a very important role. Uh, we have a lot of information, but also a lot of misinformation. So people are very, very much confused. So the world has become a, a complete one, one unit with a lot of factors influencing our daily life. And in, in such a chaotic situation, we do need leaders, business leaders, political leaders, and media leaders to actually guide us uh, forward. And furthermore, uh, you just mentioned about China. I think in the post-pandemic era, China will increasingly become part of the world. If you look at the Chinese entrepreneurs, they're everywhere. Everywhere in the world, you see Chinese entrepreneurs. And in the meantime, China has become a big market in which entrepreneurs from the whole world can go there. To and I think global business integration will become a trend. And in that direction, I think everybody can uh, get more opportunities than in the past. I would like to add something there. Okay. I would like to... Dan, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. please, please Thank go. you. Uh, I'd like to make some examples uh, and a comment first. We are all talking about a post-pandemic environment. But when we look at it, what did happen in this pandemic? Take a tsunami. You have the first wave, you have the second wave, and then the water goes back. And then you see what mess is still there. We don't see the mess yet. That's my opinion. And what the pandemic showed us, it was an acceleration of trends and it not, not everything is new. So the first thing, what we were looking at in the past before the pandemic, and let's make two, three concrete examples, what we did. When you look at, and I think this is a pretty interesting example, hopefully, is when you look at the mRNA technology that we have now with BioNTech or with, with Moderna and all this, this is a thing that we have the development of new drugs, biopharma. That's it. And normally it takes you eight, nine, ten years to develop that. And how good is human, is a human, uh, is human mankind that we develop that in one year or in one and a half years to get billions of people vaccinated? That's a fantastic result. So it's an, it's a life test. It's a life medical phase one, two, three, and the whole world is watching it. And this will have a traumatic impact because we were forced to deliver. Second, touchless payment system, asset light. So this is everybody doesn't want to touch when you go in, when you want to do parking or whatever. You don't want to touch it because you want to be protected. So this will have an impact. And then issues like circular economy that everybody talked about. But when you look at this and let's do the plastic, you have seven different parts of plastic different, different words. So not everything is beautiful pet, but you have really bad things where you have chemicals and oil and all this in the plastic. But when you can change that to renewable chemicals, but then it's a different story. So what we want to look at is with littered resources, and if it's 2050, we have 10 billion people on the planet, they all need to eat. So are there new ways for food security to create proteins, because we need proteins at the end of the day. That's my personal opinion. So we want to make sure that the people have enough water to drink before you need to drink before you eat, before we get any migration streams. So we have a lot of challenges that we are now faced with. And I think one of the critical points from a strategic standpoint, if we look for, and that was your question, Dan, for the long-term sustainable developments, when we look at this, we want to make sure that we have a right view where to allocate money, what is really priority. And this is something we, we, we don't know. Uh, it's a pressing thing. And when you look at chi climate change, what Fiona mentioned, well, all the consequences out of that, hurricanes, uh, a drought, whatever. So we don't know about the consequences. So we need to be very careful in our opinion uh, when we look at financial markets, that we are in the right fields and that we understand where cash-generating businesses are. 
Great. Dima, thoughts? Um, so, first of all, I would like to uh, share my thoughts about uh, China, and uh, uh, which used to be an emerging market. And all the emerging markets at the time were seeking for cheap energy, okay, to pump the economy, and they were not respecting the IP rights. And, uh, uh, you know, it is like India uh, at the time and also other countries, emerging markets. So we had uh, America, who is producing the biggest uh, part of the pollution of the world, and then we have seen uh, more and more emerging markets coming in and uh, creating pollution. So for the long time, the growth uh, can be... Uh, can become uh, can emerge from uh, the the fight against pollution. I believe that it is uh, a big shame to go to a Beijing to Beijing, which is a wonderful city, and not be able to see it because it is always getting darker after 20 minutes of sun. So I have had the opportunity to be in Beijing once. They have had very uh, prominent visitor, so they have started producing uh, coal all over Beijing, and I had had the opportunity to see Beijing in the light of the sun. It is a wonderful city. It's a, a green city. Nobody can can believe that it has parks, it has uh, small uh, rivers. It is a fantastic place. It's a place to be, but you are not able to see it. So I have talked to several investors and businessmen from China. <clears throat> they are all welcoming technologies that can stop pollution. They want to have filters. They want to have clean energy. They want to have clean water. They want to have everything clean and renewable and uh, sustainable. And they are there. They have the money. They, they have the will. And now they are ready to accept everything. But where are the technologies? As you said, there are technologies that uh, as, are coming as a reaction to the uh, COVID. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sure that there are too many people gaining billions out of vaccination uh, plant programs or from gloves or whatever you want. But the real question is who will keep water on this planet? We need quantities of water. We need quantities of fresh air. We need uh, very specific things to be done in order to preserve our planet. So I believe that in Luxembourg, which is one of the biggest securitization uh, country in the world, today we are making securitization uh, companies for billions and billions just for renewable energy. So we are creating bonds for five, six, seven years from now. This is not for the future. This is for short term. The long term must be a plan for 20, 30 years where we will envisage <clears throat> how we will create jobs for people. We are having now the robots are coming in. What do we do with people? This is the question. I have visited China and I, have, I, I couldn't believe that there are people cleaning the, the national highways. Every three kilometers you are having somebody cleaning the highway because you need to have people people working and getting getting money out of their job and and have dignity of what they are doing so i believe it is a very very complicated issue the inflation is not the issue for me what it is the issue is the human being and the human dignity so okay i am definitely uh, for uh, investing in a responsible way our money and we need to know what kind of percentage of our basket goes to sustainability and what goes for things that it is against it. Because I'm not sure that, you know, fintech is the future. Fintech is a way to, you know, to make AML uh, <laughs> bypassing and things like that. What we need today is definitely is somebody to inspire us and say, you, you got to go to the good, to the good uh, technologies. You have to save the planet. And you can do it by gaining money. And this is very good news because all my clients, investors, 
are ready to put their money and sacrifice even 20% of their profit, but to do it for their children. You know, actually we are financing more than 200 uh, megawatts of photovoltaics in Greece, and nobody is able to tell us what we will do with the panels after 25 years. The panels will be garbage, and we don't know what to do with them. And you know, the new trend is to have hybrid photovoltaics, to have battery and photovoltaics. So you have two pollution sources. Mm -hmm. And after 20 years, what are you going to do with this? So we have to think, you know, more openly and uh, to be uh, more honest to, to, our, uh, to our children. That, that's the thing. Understood. Thank you so much. Welcome. We have we have four minutes remaining. So what I would ask is a closing thought from from each of you. Uh, Takeaway. It can be an investment idea, or something to think about. But one final takeaway from from each of you. Um, why don't we start with Yu Feng? Okay. Um, I think currently the world situation among the governments and uh, companies uh, is a uh, kind of. Um, uh, conflict uh, escalating, particularly led between the United States, uh, the U.S. and China. That is really causing quite a lot of uh, troubles also for business people to, to work together. I think governments really should keep the dialogue open and we should uh, jointly uh, among the companies developing our international standards, technical standards, so that uh, repollution will be excluded um, uh, uh, from technical point of view. Uh, this, this kind of uh, um, uh, platforms as we have today should be uh, ex exerting more influence both on governments and companies uh, together. And then we probably are talking about the same things in the future. Thank you. Well said, thank you. Matthias, would you like to go next? Yes, please. Um, for me, what is critical is that each of us, private life, business life, managers, running money, that we try hard that all we do in our business and our investment activities have a positive impact on society, that we ask that question to ourselves. Is that what I'm doing and is that where I'm investing in? Is this something I understand and what impact it will have for the generations to come? And the second thought is leadership is not being a manager. Managers are leaders, but they are administrating a system. And leaders, for me, the real leaders are visionaries. And when you have a vision, you need to have the capability of empathy and also to bring the vision to reality. So in other words, we should support leaders. We should think out of the box and reflect is this something visionary? Does it help? Is it transformative? And if this is the case, we should support them in whatever sort, uh, uh, form, and in our business and in our investments. So it's up to us to look at us first and not pointing the fingers to others, because when you point fingers, three fingers are looking at you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fiona. Okay, so I think um, what has worked in the past will change. Obviously, uh, the asset class that has worked in the past won't be the same because we go from an invest in environment of yield going down to an environment of yield going up because of inflation risk. We live in a world where it is, even though we all want to invest sustainability complicated because obviously sometimes you want to do good in E and perhaps you go too fast in S. Typically, if we go too fast in the climate transition, perhaps we'll create social inequalities even more. So although we are all full of good intentions, it's very important to make sure that we have the right balance, that we invest uh, accordingly. And third, I would say, is not only invest, but engage, meaning that when we invest, we have a responsibility to vote if we are shareholders of a company and to engage with this company to make them progress as the example of Exxon last week or Shell last week. 
Super, thank you. Last but not least, Demos, send us off some okay. wisdom. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, there is always the example of McDonald's menu, okay? So we have <laughs> McDonald's uh, price going always up, never went down. And we have always the profit going upper and upper and upper, meaning the percentage of the profit of a McDonald's menu is fantastic. Nobody has ever thought of what is the nutrition value and what is the content of this menu that gives you so much profit, <laughs> so much profit for the last 30 years or 40 years. So what I want to say is that we don't 